So my name is Jake. Some of you have met me before. I'm based here in Shanghai, in China. I have been working as a teacher trainer and a manager and a teacher for the last 15 years in Asia.、Uh, I've travelled all over Asia, training in China, Cambodia,、uh, outside of China,、um, Japan a lot,、uh, also in Greater China, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, etc. And we're, today we're going to focus on. Well, I always say every week that this is my favourite topic, but reading is always one of my favourite topics. So, I just want to talk today、uh, about what we can do with reading to ensure our kids keep reading once they leave the classroom. So, a lot of the theme of my webinars are what do we do in the classroom to help kids keep learning. Kids keep learning outside the classroom, and that will continue today. So, first question, and you're going to have to type. Is who likes reading? I do. I like reading. So who likes reading? I do. Yeah, good, Eleanor. Good. I. The reason I ask this question is I have done this training face to face many times, and a lot of teachers will show up and I'll say who likes reading, or I will finish the training and some teachers say, oh, you know. The biggest problem I have is I just don't like reading. So no wonder their kids don't like reading. I, I'm always surprised when I meet teachers who don't like reading. It surprises me. But I think that the first key is that we like reading, right? Of course, if you like reading, you are much more likely to want to teach reading, and you're much more likely to show a model to the kids of what they want to do to start reading. The next question I have. And you can just type single words. Is why do you read? Why do you read? If anyone can't hear me, why do you read? Any ideas that you have? Yeah, a broad vision. Yeah, I like that one. Zelda. Eleanor, I don't see Julia today, and I don't see quite a few people that are usually here. I hope there's no connection problem. I don't see Chairman, who is usually here, and I don't. See, yeah, okay, that's okay. So why do we read? Yes, pleasure. Exactly, Eleanor. A great way to react, relax, enrich my imagination. Exactly. What else? I think you know. For me, it's things. In, I, I read a lot of nonfiction. So for knowledge, hi, German, you're here. Good to see you. What else? Yes, for interest, knowledge, relaxing, get to know the world. Yeah, exactly. So this is sort of the fundamental part of why we have a problem with our students. Let's have a look. So as you guys said. Why do we read? Yes, of course we read for pleasure. Yes, knowledge. Yes, imagination and inspiration. Yes, to relax. Yes, and I think someone said that to get a broader perspective on life. Yes, no one in real life reads to just go and do a test. Not outside of school, right? We don't read to do a test. Now I don't know if it's the same in Russia or in、uh, Turkey, but in China, for example, where I teach, the only reason kids do read is to do a test. They read a comprehension and then they answer the questions. And no wonder they don't like reading. Most kids I speak to, when they think of reading in English, they think it's part of a subject and it's part of doing a test. So. The main thing I like to talk to teachers about, and that's what I want to talk about today, is how do we get kids to realise all of these things and not think of English as a test? And the way we do that is changing the way we teach. Right? Before we continue, I want you to remember one thing: that learning to read is really difficult. Right? 
I think that they, um, I can't remember the name of the researcher, but they said learning to read will be one of the most difficult things we ask a young mind to do. And it's difficult in our native language. It's very difficult. And then we say to our kids in their second language, I also want you to learn to read. And I want to highlight this issue, and I don't have the solution for it, but reading is difficult in your second language. And most kids have to go to an English class and they're learning to speak, listen, write, and read all at the same time. And a lot of the time, they don't even have the vocabulary to begin reading, or they don't have the grammar to begin reading. They don't have the phonemic skills to begin reading. So it, it's, we, I want people to realize how difficult it is for a second language learner to begin reading and keep that in mind that every time you're in a class with these children, the reading is really difficult. So if they can speak at this level, they should probably only be reading at this level. But a lot of the time we're pushing them to read more than they can even say. And this happens a lot in China where, where they're forced to do these really difficult comprehensions and they don't understand what they're reading, so they never read a book again. And that's really sad because we know how important reading is. And, and, and the other part I want to mention is, and I hope this is true also in uh, Turkey and Russia and Moscow, etc., is that parent involvement in the child learning to read is essential to how they're going to learn to read. We know that children who have parents who read will read more. And children who have parents who don't read tend to not read. So whenever we're talking to our parents, they always say, oh, what can I do, what can I do? And the best thing they can do with their kids is just be showing them how to read. Zelda, what do you, um, Zelda is typing, I'm very interested to hear. Yeah, exactly, Zelda. The parents, uh, the main thing a parent can do is model the behavior that they expect from their children. Model the behavior, just like with anything. So if you're, if you're a parent who reads a lot, your child will read a lot. If you're a parent who just sits down, they don't even have to understand the books. But if they sit down and um, if they sit down and work, just one second, sorry. Yeah. If they sit down with their kids and just go through the pictures with them and even talk in their native language, the child's going to be more interested. So, guys, has anyone seen this research here on the impact of reading for 20 minutes a day? It's a very famous research from the, uh, from the nine, oh, can't write in white on white. Let me get a better color. Famous research from 1987, and it was uh, conducted in the U.S., so this is for native speakers, but it talks about the, the impact of reading just for 20 minutes per day. So if a, if a child reads, if a student reads for one minute per day, then we know that they're exposed to about 8,000 words per year. Not new words, but 8,000 words. And they're likely to score on about the the bottom 10%, but at least they're getting exposed to new language, to, to, to words. A child that reads for five minutes a day is exposed to 280,000 words per year, and they're likely to score in the 50th percentile, so around the middle in any standardized test on reading. But the big step is that students who read 20 minutes a day are exposed to 1.8 million words per year. Now that's native speakers, okay? That's native speakers. And we, we haven't seen the research on second language uh, students. But what this is, what I'm trying to highlight here is that students who read 10 or 20 minutes a day are exposed to more language. We all live in countries where it's difficult for our students to see English around them and to hear English around them, right? So if you have them reading just 10 or 20 minutes a day, that's 10 minutes or 20 minutes more exposure. Now, I don't know what the exact number of words is, but even if it's half or a quarter, at least they're exposed to all these words and then they'll do better because, let's have a look. Oh, sorry, I'll answer that question in a minute. But I want to ask you, this is for you guys to answer, 
What do you think are the biggest hurdles? What are the biggest challenges for our students to be learning to read? What do you think are the biggest hurdles or the biggest problems? Anyone can type in if you can hear me. Zelda, great. Sorry, guys, my cat is here and she's trying to get my attention. Okay, concentration. Yeah, Zelda, I, I think I'm talking more about what, what do they need to be able to, yeah, concentration is a great one. That's a big one. Anything else? Eleanor? Chairman? Tosan? Mr. Tosan? Yeah, Eleanor. I think that's the key. Eleanor, you really hit on the, yeah, I know what you meant. So attention, yes. Attention is a hard one. So I think next week I'm doing, uh, on the 12th, I'm doing one on motivation. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Eka, uh, Kate, exactly. Vocabulary. I would have vocabulary at the top. And we know vocabulary is at the top because, um, because we know vocabulary is at the top because if you don't know the words that are on the page, uh, then there's no way that your kids can then read those words. So what happens is a lot of the time we're expecting kids to read words they've never even heard before. So vocabulary is number one. Number, uh, the other point about that is a lot of research shows that 90, you need to know about 95% of the words on the page to be able to learn new words on the page. That's people like Paul Nation, etc. If you're interested in looking up research, look up Paul Nation. Uh, he's probably the world's leading expert on second language uh, reading. Number two, so vocabulary is number one for sure. The environment, which I think is just what I mean is we're forcing our kids to read at a desk or in the classroom and being quite strict. Whereas in real life, we don't read like that. We read on the sofa. So we need to make that more comfortable. Phonics ability, meaning the ability to sound out new words. When I see a new word like big, of course I can sound this out, right? B -E -G, and I can think about what that word might be. For a lot of kids who've never done phonics in English, it's very hard for them to do that. So then they say, oh, new word, I don't know it, I won't even try. And the last one is teachers and schools is, is the hurdle because we are expecting ELT teachers to also be experts in teaching reading. And teaching reading is difficult, right? So I didn't know how to teach reading when I started. And also a lot of schools expecting a lot from the kids with reading without actually teaching them how to go home and read. So that's what I really want to hope we can do. The next point I want to make is reading is difficult, but we know these positive things about reading before i show you my model if you're reading your subconsciously let me get a different color yeah if you're reading you're subconsciously being taught grammar you keep seeing the same structures coming up again he was blah 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 so the more they see that grammar the more it's going in and sticking somewhere it consciously teaches vocabulary as i said if a student knows 95% of the words, 95% eh, of the words, they're more likely to be able to pick up new words. If there's pictures, for example, here, and I don't know what, uh, if I don't know what cornflakes are, for example, in this one, I can at least look at the picture and learn the new vocabulary. They teach culture. So in Australia, we have wombats. Now, if I read this book, I'm going to learn all about wombats and platypuses and uh, marsupials, but I'm at least learning some culture. It teaches knowledge. My favorite books for knowledge are stuff, the, I don't know if you've ever seen these, Science Vocabulary Readers, great books. Short, easy to read, kids love them, lots of cool topics that they can then learn something while they're reading. And the last one, if kids start reading on their own, it empowers those children, right? I mean, obviously it does. So let's continue. So what, what's the difference between intensive and extensive reading? Does anyone want to type? So let's start. What is intensive reading? What skills are intensive reading? 
What skills are intensive reading? What? Yeah, good. Thanks, Zelda. Oh, okay. No worries. Anyone else? I'm sure Eleanor can answer this question. And I'm sure that Chairman can answer this question. And I'm sure Kate can answer this question. Let's have a look. Ah, might be reading for pleasure. So no, intensive reading skills are all our basic skills like uh, we say reading for gist, uh, finding, let me just change the color of my typing, you know, finding new words, uh, you know, just learning to read from left to right, uh, you know, identifying Identi, I can't spell, identifying, um, oh gosh, identifying, why does it, oh, I know why, identifying uh, grammar points, etc. These are all in, intensive reading skills. They, they make the child look directly onto one thing, right? You're teaching them, yeah, exactly. Reading but not fast, reading each individual word, going through the book. I, I, you know, we do it all the time in class. It's the main way that we read, right? We say, okay, kids, let's have a look here. Let me just make this big for a second. You know, we'll be saying to the kids, okay, Kipper is surprised. He sees. This is very intensive. It's it, it means what it says actually. It makes a child feel like it's a very big chore. Extensive reading is things like we said, reading for pleasure, uh, enjoying yourself, learning new things. You know, extensive reading, if you think about it, is how we read. It's lying on the sofa, reading a new book, getting new information, but not having to answer questions. So a comprehension is intensive. Just reading for fun is extensive. And one thing about extensive reading is that kids are not taught how to do it. They're taught how to read each individual word and sit down and really concentrate. But they're not taught how to just relax and enjoy reading. And there's a lot more to reading than just looking at the words. And that's what I want to show you today. The more that we get our kids to love reading, the more they're going to be, the better they're going to be at intensive reading. So I want to see how we can join those two together. We want to, we still need to teach them the intensive reading skills. They still need to learn how to sound out every word and they still need to know their sight words, etc. But if they can start to do some extensive reading, they'll be better at intensive reading. Let's have a look. What can we do? do I wonder if you can see the slide let's look at what we can do so I'm going to show you the model and that when I first came across this it completely changed the way I teach reading even if you just have a small reading passage and it can be for any age group so there's going to be six things in this right six the first one is okay let me just take a step back Imagine you're going to a bookshop. Imagine you're going to a bookshop and you walk into the bookshop and you look at all the signs above the books and you might see uh, travel and you see history and then you see philosophy and then you see literature and then you see poetry. All of those help you start to set a context. You sort of go, if I go to the travel section, I know that all the books are going to be about countries and maybe food and how we travel. So setting a context is getting your student's brain to be in the context of the book we're going to read. We call it activating schema, right? So it's activating schema and it's all the words that your kids might know about that. 
So let's have a look at a book here. This is a cool one. Well, let me. This is a good book. Yeah, this is a great one. Really simple way to look at it. So we have the toys party, right? We're going to go to the toys party. Obviously, before we start reading this book, we're going to talk about parties. Do you like parties? Have you been to a party? Where was the last party? What did you see at the party? What did you eat at the party? So then the kids are already getting all that vocabulary about the party. Not just open the book on page 21. It's let's really start to think about it. It's called setting a context, right? It's the same thing we do when we go to a bookshop. If I see the philosophy section, I start to think about what these books will be about. The next one is predicting. So if I'm in the history section and I pick up a book and it's on the history of America, I'm going to be already thinking what are they going to be talking about from what I know, right, from my previous knowledge. So then I'll start to think, oh, it's probably about, you know, maybe Christopher Columbus or it's about bringing people over or it's about immigration. Whatever it's about, I'll be predicting what it's about. And you do this naturally. As an adult, we pick up a book and we subconsciously predict what it's about. We don't know we're doing that. The next one is the next one is asking questions. What we do as adults is we'll start to think, what will I find out in this book? Who was the first person who did this or something? You know, we start to think about what we predict, but then we ask specific questions. So in this book, for example, let's just have a look at the first three. Let's just have a look at the first three. So the context is a party, right? And then I ask my students, let's predict what's going to happen. And then I ask them to ask a question. So for example, I'll say, what's his name? What's his name? Then they have to start guessing, making some more questions. Can you guys think of a question that you would need to ask? It might be, does the dog like eating cake? It doesn't matter what the question is. Can you think of a question you can ask this book? Any question. Does the dog like eating? Any question, but you can't open the book yet. Yeah, exactly, Zelda, perfect. Are they schoolmates? Okay, German, what do you think? Sorry, the video is backwards, so I keep getting confused. <laughs> yeah, what toys have you got? Perfect, German. All these questions, and then I, what we do is we get the kids to write down all those questions, and then they can ask each other. But you haven't opened the book yet because you're getting them to think about what's going to happen in this book, and then at least they're speaking. Or they don't have to write it down. They can just speak. If they're too small, just let them speak. It might just be, is this a teddy bear? It could be very simple, right? But by doing this, what you're getting the kids to do is really think, okay, I want to read the book now. I'm motivated to read the book. I want to concentrate on reading this book. The next thing you can do, this is just a side one, but you get them to start visualizing. You can say, okay, we're not going to read the book yet. Close your eyes. How many teddy bears can you see? And they close their eyes and all the kids in the class yell out, I can see three, I can see two, I can see ten. But what you're getting them to do is starting to cognitively, you know, use that part of the brain that is visual and full of imagination. So they're picturing the book before we even go into the book. You know, they say these days um, we've, we've lost that skill of, of visualizing. Our kids don't have as much imagination because of computer games and movies etc i remember when the first harry potter book came out i don't know if you read harry potter but when the book came out and there was no movie we just we read the book and we imagined what hogwarts looked like we imagined what harry looked like now we just think harry potter looks like the guy from the movie daniel radcliffe but you know what I mean? When you were little and you read a book, sometimes you have to really picture that book. We need to get our kids doing that so it encourages their imagination. 
Anyway, so we've done all of that now. We've set a context. We've predicted. We've asked some questions. We've visualized. And now we can read the book, right? Now we open the book and we start to look at it. You see, all these things happen before you read the book, and all of them are natural, and all of them will help your child get excited to wanting to read when they go home. You, you want to make this second nature. After they read the book, I think this is the most important step. Don't worry about doing a test. Don't ask them any questions. Just talk about it. Just get them into, <laughs> into groups and say, Talk about your book. If you want to use Russian, use Russian. If you, uh, if you want to use your L1 or Turkish, use Turkish. But at least they're engaging in the book. And then you can encourage them to speak English. You know, you might finish this book and the kids say, one kid says, I like parties. Another kid says, he is happy or he is sad. Another kid says, this was the greatest party I've ever seen. But it, then it lets the kids really take control of what, they're, what they've been reading. And that's the real key to learning English, right? Taking control of your own learning. So try to remember these because I'm going to test you at the end. Uh, set a context, predict, ask questions, visualize, read, discuss. Let's play a few games. So the big thing, the other big thing to think about is what can you do before, during, and after reading? What can you do before, during, and after? So let's have a look at what we can do. Sorry, I just want to make sure I've got my, uh, yeah, what can we do before reading? Let's have a look. So before we open the book, we talked about prediction. Prediction is a huge one. Prediction is all about getting them to guess what's going to happen in the future. It's a beautiful skill to learn for reading. But here, let's have a look at a few more. This is one of my favorite games to play with kids. This one is called, what can you see, what can you smell, and what can you hear? Sorry, what can you see, what can you smell, and what can you hear? So let's try and play it. Uh, so what can you see, what can you smell, and what can you hear? Let's try and play on the big screen. Let's, let's get away from our party now. Let's go to, oh, yeah, this is a good one. Oh, yeah, this is a good one, okay. So let's go to the big screen really quickly. The first one is easy, right? What can you see? So the kids just yell out, I can see a car. I can see a wind. I can see leaf. I can see this. But then we start to make it more interesting. We say, hmm, what can you smell? Now, they can't smell the book, right? So they've got to really start thinking. What do I think this might smell like? Have a look on... Let's do the one with the party again because there's a lot to smell. So what can you smell? What can you smell? Tell me, what can you smell on this book? It's a bit hard for me to get it in the camera. What can... Yeah, I can smell the cake. What else can you smell? Can you smell the dog? Oh, he's so stinky. Can you smell the tea? Oh, I can smell the tea. Does it smell good? Does it smell bad, right? Then you're getting the kids to really interact with the book. You haven't started reading yet. You don't need to read yet. You're getting them to think about it. Also, they can go home and ask mom and dad, daddy, what can you smell? And then daddy has to smell, you know what I mean? The next one is, what can you hear? I like this one. What can you hear? This is a good page. What can you hear in this page? What can you hear? Oh, yeah, a car, talking, wind. Yeah, awesome, guys. Awesome. So you see, guys, just from this very simple activity, what can you see? You get to get all their vocabulary. What can you smell? You're getting them to wake up their senses. What can you hear? You're concept checking what they know, right? So you're starting to realize, ah, this book's going to be about wind. And now they're setting a context, right? So all those things that we talked about before. The next one is really, really simple. Guys, just give me two seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in this one, really simple one is just, 
I like this is a really simple one. It's just race, right? So you get the kids in collab in in groups together, even if they're older, and you say, okay, I want you to find the color red, and the kids have to run and do 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 do. Here is red, teacher. Here is red, teacher. Here is red. Here is red. The reason you do this activity is because you're getting them to go in and turn the pages, right? They're starting to get used to playing with the book, turning, getting involved in the book, and then they're going to concentrate for longer. You know, find the characters. Where is the boy? Where is the daddy? Where is the mummy? Can you find the word? Oh, this is a great one for sight words. You know, sight words, right? Like the and was all these sight words you can get them to go in and you know find the word find the word the and they've got to go on every page and find the 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 but what they're doing really is starting to engage with the book and they're engaging with the text it's a super fun way right race to find often i put the book at the front of the classroom and the kids are at the back and they have to run up open it find as many as they can and then go back to the back of the classroom yeah, and the last one is letters. If they're very young, you might just say, find the letter A, find the letter B, find the letter F, right? But at least then they're opening the book and engaging. Also, all these games here, you can play with parents. So as I said, if parents get involved, the kids are more likely to get involved. This is a great game to show your parents, and then the parents can play it with the kid. Because they, the parents might not speak great English. They just have to say one word red and then the kids can find it you know one word is all they have to say and the parents feel more confident the same one again how many so you go back in how many the how many red how many balls can you see how many daddies can you see right so the kids are going back in but now they're counting one two three four five but you're using different parts of the brain and you're engaging in the book so that's a, that's a lot of what you can do before you even start reading. And also, that's setting a context, right? Because if they're going through the book looking, they're starting to think, oh, what's the book going to be about? But you're doing it quite fast. The next one is during. And I'm just going to give you four points for during. So we did what can you see? We already did that. What can you smell? What can you hear? One of the big ones to start doing when they're reading, so you've read a few pages, say we go back to the party one, obviously, so we read the first page and it says, so we're going to compare to real life, right? So let's have a look. So on the first page we say, Biff and Chip cannot come. Mum and Dad cannot come. And then we turn over, okay, am I going the right way? Kipper gets his toys. Of course, now what you want to ask is, what toys do you have? What toys can you bring to the party? By doing that, what you're doing is you're, you're letting them think about real, they, they're, they're thinking about what, what do I have? How does this relate to me? What toys would you bring to the party? Rather than just I'm reading a story. Of course, they, everyone knows what happens next, so guess what happens on the next page. And again, we can do lots of how many, how many, how many, how many can you see? So you're not asking questions about the story yet. You're asking questions just to get them more engaged in this in the whole reading process. The last one is what do we do after we read? And this is exciting, right? So after we read, I just say get into pairs and talk about it. That's all you have to do. Discuss the book. And I love letting them speak in their L1 for a minute and then say, try to do it in, sorry, try to do it in English, right? So they might, that means that every kid might have a different answer, but then you're personalizing the book. You're letting them take control. And if you remember, taking control is one of the biggest motivators. So let them just talk about the book. What do you do when you finish a book? Whenever I finish a book, if I read a book, the first thing I do, for example, I just read this book. Well, I read half of it, but the first thing I did after I read the first chapters was I told a friend. By the way, excellent book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, really teaches you about the way our subconscious and conscious minds work. You see, I'm telling a friend. That's exactly what we do, and that's what we should get our kids to do once they leave the classroom, say, Tell two friends about this book for homework. Your homework is not answer questions. 
Your homework is tell kids about the book. Tell your mum and dad about the book. But there's no answers, no right or wrong. For very small kids, I love doing this one, is just draw the book, you know, so they have to draw, oh, look, here's my friend, and he's at a party, yay. And then the most important one, when a kid finishes a book, let them read it again. My daughter and I have read this book, for example. I've read this book 20 times because she loves the story. And why would a lot of parents in, in language teaching think, my kid's already read this book, so I don't need to read it again. And I, I think that's silly because it's natural to read a book again, right? I'm sure all of you have read a book more than once and you'll get something more from it. So going on, huh? I think we've, ooh, oh, right. So can you remember, here's a little test. Can you remember the six things? The first one was set a context. What happens after you set a context? Can anyone remember? Number one was set a context. Can you remember the next one? Number two. Kate, for sure. Yes, number two is predict. Good job, Kate. Number three. Who's going to be first? Zelda, ask questions. Yes. Remember, guys, asking questions is about the students asking questions, not you. You don't need to ask the questions because you're the teacher. You know the book. You know how to speak English. If the kids are asking questions and they can ask each other, what will then they're more likely to want to read the book. Number four, this is a hard one. Yeah, awesome. Start to visualize. Get them to picture the book in their minds before they read the book. What will you see? How big will the mother be? How small will the daddy be? I don't know. But number five is, yeah, read. Finally, you can read, right? And the last one is discuss, right? So that's awesome, guys. And each one of those stages, you can be doing some of those activities I mentioned, you know. So what can you see? What can you hear? What can you smell? You know, counting how many things. All of those times you can be keep on doing those activities to keep them more engaged. So, guys, I want to make two, two last points before we wrap up, a little bit shorter. The last point I want to make is, sorry, click. Uh-huh. Seems we're very slow today. Ah, yes. And next page. Hmm. Sorry, I'm just trying to get onto the next page, but it doesn't want to let me. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it then while I'm waiting for it to come up. Yeah, I'll just talk about it. So, I what, sorry. Yes, which book? So, Many parents ask me and many teachers say, what is the right level book for my student or my child? They'll come to you and say, I don't know which books to buy for my child. Or schools will say, is this the right level for a level one or grade two? Now, here, here, is the, here is the arguments, right? There are two arguments. The first argument is we should always have the kids reading at the exact level that they need. And there is some advantages to that because the kids can feel like they're progressing. There used to be the famous five finger test. Do you know the five finger test? So the five finger test is you ask a kid to pick up a book and if the reading the first page or maybe the two pages if it's not many words, if there's a word they don't know, they read and they say, okay, I don't know a word. I don't know a word. I don't know a word. I don't know that word. If they get to five words in the first page, then the book is too hard, right? That's what they say. The, the, the problem with this, guys, is that it means that kids tend to stop reading books that are too difficult for them. That's one problem. And the other problem is I think students can take control of what level. If a kid picks up a book and it's too easy, do you know what they will do? 
they will find a book that is more difficult, right? Have a look here. This book is quite difficult. It's got a lot of words on every page. If it's too difficult, they'll go to a book like this and say, okay, this is much easier. Then this is too easy. So then they'll go to another level. The point is provide more books. If they have more opportunity to choose different books, they're more likely then to find the right level for themselves. So my argument is, which book? Let the child choose. Let them choose the topic. Let them choose the level. The last point I want to make is that what reading really does is it provides exposure to real English. If it, it provides exposure to knowledge. It provides exposure to grammar. And it provides exposure to culture. And just by having books, it's almost like we're bringing in another country into the classroom or into the home. Now, I know in China, we don't see English very much. There's no English TV. Uh, you don't see very many English signs. You do see English signs, but they don't get much exposure to English. I'm not sure if it's the same in Turkey or in Moscow, but by having books, we increase the exposure to the language. And really, that's the key to getting kids to acquire languages. The more they're exposed, the more chance they're going to have to learn on their own. So, yeah, that's all I want to say today. I'm going to wrap up and say thank you. Uh, before we go, don't go, I just want to recommend the next three podcasts are going to be probably pretty, they're going to be pretty cool podcasts, uh, sorry, web, webinars. This one was a little bit simpler and a bit easier to, to get onto. The next one is on motivation. Uh, can I just try and share my screen? How can I share my screen? Hold on a second. Can you, I guess, uh, I thought I was sharing my screen. Apparently I can't share my screen, so I won't share my screen. <laughs> what I would do though is talk to you and say, um, the next three uh, webinars are, one, motivating young learners. The difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is all the things like stickers and rewards for doing things, and intrinsic is getting you to want to do it. So I really want to talk about how we can get more intrinsic motivation and the dangers of extrinsic motivation. The next one after that is on metacognition. How do we get kids to improve their learning skills and think about learning even when they're only six or seven? Uh, the one after that is on how we learn languages and what, are the new, what does the new research say about learning languages? What do things like frequency, feedback and exposure have to do with language learning? And the one after that is on learning th through play and that brings us to the end of the year. If there are any Spanish people, we have a Spanish one coming up on November the 6th on technology in the class, ah, sorry, on learner strategies. So that's it. I will send through this podcast as usual, um, podcast webinar. I will send this webinar through. I don't think I sent through last week's one, but I will send this one through and have a great day. Thank you very much for coming. And yeah, check your emails and definitely you'll be able to watch this again a short version as well and i'll send you all the content you can share with your friends and please check us out on studycat.com and please share with your friends the more people that we have the more interaction we can have selda goodbye kate goodbye eleanor good to see you uh who else we got oh chairman yeah cool good to see you i think chairman had to go but peace bye bye